I'm from the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, and welcome to the final uh, panel of the day. We're gonna be discussing intersectionality in healthcare and healthcare reform. So first, I just want to give a topical overview, quick and dirty, of what single-payer healthcare is and what our current healthcare system looks like. Um, before I dive into any other slides, does anybody recognize this woman in the wheelchair in the top right picture? You do? Yeah, so her name is Carrie Ann Lucas. Uh, she's from Colorado. She's a disability rights advocate, and she actually passed away last week because her insurance claim was denied. So I just wanted to give that quick moment to uh, say rest in power, Carrie. So what makes up a good healthcare system? There's lots that there's a lot that needs to be considered when designing or implementing a healthcare system. You know, you need good access, it needs to be affordable, the care itself needs to be high quality, it needs to be equitably distributed, everyone needs to be covered, and it also needs to be comprehensive. But what is our, um, and what do providers want of their healthcare system? You know, we want it to be a simple funding and payment mechanism, uh, we want adequate and timely payments, uh, um, it needs to be easily administered, we don't want to spend all of our time with billing and administration. Um, and again, we want comprehensive coverage of patients' care that's cheap, fair, and equitable. In addition, we, of course, want quality medical education, research, and technology. But what's wrong with our healthcare system right now? We can see that there's lots of barriers to access to care, as well as high rates of uninsurance, and especially high rates of underinsurance. So these are people who have insurance who might not get the care that they need. Costs are extremely high. Um, it's twice as high as most other industrialized nations. Uh, quality is falling behind. We actually, one indicator is life expectancy, and it's a very broad uh, indicator, and we actually have seen that drop for two years consecutively. We also want to make sure that patients have choice in where they seek care. And we also want a system that's efficient. You know, it's not fragmented, it's not bureaucratic. And in addition, we want a healthcare system that is equitable. And we, currently we see lots of inequities in our healthcare system, not just in terms of access, but in terms of quality of care and the individuals who get that care. So what is single payer? So single payer, I'm sure everybody knows this, but we wanna go over it again really quickly. It's a government financed healthcare system. It's not a government run healthcare system. And I think there's a lot of people who misunderstand that fact. We also understand that it's universal. It covers everybody in, uh, or it covers everyone. Um, it's comprehensive. There's no real fiscal barriers to seeking care at the individual level. And a sing it also involves a single public agency that processes and pays bills. And one of the questions that we usually get from uh, opponents of single payer is like, how are we gonna fund it? You know, what are the costs associated with it? And I wanna push back against that and argue that, you know, the current system that we have is just as expensive and just as bureaucratic and difficult to administer. So this is a very broad topical overview of our current payment system for healthcare. And I might be missing some things, so um, don't hate me because of that. But healthcare financing falls into like three broad categories. So at the top we have private insurers, you know, such as United Health, Blue Cross, Aetna. We have state uh, methods of funding healthcare, like Medicaid. Um, and then we also have federal methods of funding healthcare, like TriHealth or Medicare. Now this gets a little bit more complex, and uh, the payments actually are not as straightforward as we'd like. So with the state and private insurer, or federal methods of payment, those are paid for by your taxes, right? And then when it comes to private insurers, there's other forms of payment like premiums and deductibles. And even once you have private insurance, there's barriers to getting healthcare afterwards. So does the patient have pre-existing conditions? Are they in network or out of network? And then for some advanced forms of care, we have to seek prior approvals. And sometimes patients get denied care outright. And we know what the result of that might be. And of course, private insurers are publicly traded, so they have to maintain their profits to show that they're fundable. 
Even if you have insurance at one of these levels, you might not be covered for some expenses. And this is where out of, or, oh, excuse me. Um, going back to federal, we don't want to forget about the ACA. So ACA created the individual market, and it has additional complexities on top of that. Like the co-op, they have some premium subsidies, and there's other administrative issues on top of that. And then in addition, there's still out-of-pocket costs that patients are, left, are burdened with. <laughs> And so all of this is like very complex and there's a lot to take in. And when people say, how are we gonna pay for this? Or what is the cost? Well, you should just show them this and then show all the administrative costs that are added on top of all of these different uh, methods of funding. But when it comes to single payer, it's much more simple. It's just you, a single private government fund or a single government fund that's paid for by your taxes and the government fund pays directly for healthcare. It's a big difference between the last graph. Now there's currently uh, several proposed legislative bills out there that would essentially enact a single payer bill. So there's uh, Pramila's bill from my home district of Washington 7, um, or Pramila Jayapal, she has her legislation which is uh, House Bill um, 1384. And then Bernie has his bill, Senate Bill 1804. But you know these proposed legislations and implementation of single payer, it's not quite as easy as we think. It's, it, when we say everybody's in and nobody's out, it's not quite that simple. So with that, I want to introduce our panelists. And I'll just have them introduce our, themselves, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Wendy Cord. I'm a third-year medical student at the University of Washington and one of the leaders for the student national, the students for the National Health Program uh, at UW. Great. So we brought together this panel because we want to bring a different perspective to um, discussions around healthcare reform and healthcare delivery. And uh, with that, we want to discuss um, intersectionality. And uh, we brought these panelists because they have like an interesting set of experiences and. Uh, interesting sets of knowledges and knowledge and their, uh, interesting stories as well. So first, I want to open it up to the audience, and I wanted to ask you guys what what do you think intersectionality is? Like, how would you like from take, taking from your own experiences? How would you define it? Any volunteers? Common interest, like so, from various backgrounds, essentially various goals, but merging together. Hold on. One moment. Just how different factors of your um, identity affect the way that you live and are viewed in society. So things like race, class, gender, how that can affect things like healthcare and other. Um, ways of getting social services, et cetera. Hi, um, I agree. I like what she said. Um, the way I think about it is sort of our characteristics of what makes us us and how they interact with each other. So um, race, ethnicity, gender, culture, um, if someone has a disability or, or other factor that influences who they are and how it interacts um, with, and then how that, you know, have how they interact with the world around them 
do those identities and they all kind of layer on top of each other. So, yeah. We'll take just one more all the way at the top. I've seen somebody's hand. Do you guys just want to like speak up? Yeah, can you? Can you project? Can you project? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, you raise your hand. <laughs> So we'll go through the panel as well, and I want to ask you guys, like from your experiences, how would you define intersectionality, and how does that play into like not only healthcare delivery now or the lack of delivery, but also some of the discussions around healthcare legislation reform? Anybody can jump in. Um, I think it's really. I mean, I. It sounds like. Um, you know, a lot of your answers are similar, and I think the overall gestalt um, is correct in the things that um, you said. But I think it's really important to know about the history of um, of intersectionality and uh, that it comes from a very particular uh, tradition of Black feminism in this country. And um, when we think about it, we have to think in terms of um, anti-black racism in this country and um, and also sexism. Um, <clears throat> the woman to generate the term um, was a black feminist scholar, civil rights scholar um, in the 90s named Kimberly Crenshaw. You can all get out Wikipedia now. Um, and, uh, and she essentially, um, I mean to very simply put it, uh, said that um, that black women's experiences uh, could not just be thought of as black experiences um, or women's experiences, but needed to be thought of as the intersection of those things. And that those had very particular, um, that those two identities or experiences had to, uh, had a very particular expression. Um, and she explored these in um, the settings of rape and domestic violence, among other things. Um, today, uh, you know, that's a very simplistic version of it. Um, I'm sure you can read more. Um, about it, but you know, today intersectionality, the term is thrown around quite a lot, and I think overall the um, the emotion behind it is, um, in my opinion, relatively true to the I idea that um, that she had. But um, but I think that you know it's really important to to remember that history, and you know, when we use that language to pay respect to to the history of it, and think particularly about. Um, anti-racist and feminist organizing um, when we talk about intersectionality. And so for me, um, I'm really interested in uh, bringing those perspectives to the front of single-payer organizing because I, I feel that um, single-payer organizing um, is fundamentally uh, and, and must be a, an anti-racist and feminist um, issue. When I first came to, um, to the single-payer movement as a medical student in 2007 or 8, um, SNAP did not exist. SNAP, uh, I think, came into being in like 2012 when I was a resident. And um, I was very excited about single payer. I had heard about it. Um, my roommate and I, who was also a medical student of color, um, we went to one of the conferences in Boston. And, um, and I think we had sort of a similar instinct that this seemed like a, um, an anti-racist feminist movement. Um, in, you know, at, at those times, the, in, the word intersectional wasn't um, so popularly in use, um, so we didn't have that language. Um, but, and I was very surprised and disappointed to see um, that there were almost no young people, and the vast majority of people involved in Physicians for a National Health Program were older, white, mostly male, and many retired doctors. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a great tradition of, um, of progressivism in the single payer movement, um, but I uh, I think that it has only been improved by um, diversifying the movement and um, can only be improved by by bringing this language directly to the forefront um, of the work we do. So now you know when we go to the conferences every year, SNAP is there and in force. And because of the history of affirmative action in education, um, the current body of medical students looks much more diverse than the older generation of physicians. 
Um, and so those meetings are much richer, um, but I think we have a lot of work to do um, going forward in terms of bringing these perspectives um, to the forefront of our organizing. Thank you. Thank you. And when, can I ask you, you have a lot of experience in advocating for uh, some marginalized communities in getting the New York Metro bill uh, to the fore. Um, can you speak to some of your experience and how we might be able to bring that into the national movement as well? Sure. Um, I think so. I've been doing, uh, can you all hear me? I can't actually tell whether or not. Cool. Um, so I've been working on policy advocacy for about a year and four months or something. Um, before that, I wasn't in this space at all. And so when I started working on single payer, um, the first thing I did was just uh, follow around, um, like just look up Dick Gottfried's schedule of doing forums around the city and literally just kind of follow him around on tour. And um, one thing that I noticed was um, I didn't really see a lot of people who, um, for one, looked like me in the audience, but also not a lot of people that I knew. I'm, I was a social determinants person in grad school, still am. Um, I didn't see a lot of people who are represented and are being affected most by the healthcare system in those audiences or being talked to directly. And then finally, the other people that I saw following um, Assemblymember Gottfried around were um, the uh, a core group of disability and long-term care advocates who were um, being impacted by this per like particular inequity in the system. And at that a time, the New York Health Act had um, was uh, designed to include long-term care after two years. Um, so. Uh, kicking something very real and very um, huge down the, like, like just kicking down the, the line um, and not really, like those groups of people were following him, trying every t uh, chance they could to say, hey, we need to be included. Our needs need to be included. And that was something that, I didn't have the words for it at that moment, but it was odd to be in an audience that was designed around learning about a really um, inclusive policy. And there are a bunch of people saying right then they're not being included. And so um, one thing that happened over the course of my work is that I started, we're, um, in my work, we're a nonprofit that has a membership of nearly 170 human services and faith-based providers, um, as well as working across New York City, as well as um, groups in coalition across the state. So a lot of my work mean, like around single payer is just having conversations with these groups that represent faith-based um, communities, uh, long-term care communities, um, seniors, immigrant rights groups, LGBTQ, HIV, AIDS, a lot of areas that are really critical in um, to end inequalities and asking them what are their thoughts on this, what are their concerns. Here's an event, but let's get coffee afterwards and let's like let me like build that capacity with you to engage with you. Let me take that time out to talk to you about like what do you what keeps you from um, single payer and what can be done around around that because a lot of times these concerns are valid. It's not that people just disagree with it, uh, disagree with it just point blank. It's because they're not being seen and they're not feeling like their needs are being addressed by a bill. And so that's, I think, a big part of um, everybody in, nobody out. You want to actually make sure that policy is really everybody in, nobody out. And that includes building community with those communities and being an ally, and when they have policy concerns, showing up with them and supporting them. That's it. <laughs> now I want to turn it to Wendy. I think Wendy has an interesting perspective in talking about intersectionality and healthcare reform. Um, and I just want you to like tell your story and your experience of. Uh, uh, going through the healthcare system, both yourself and, you know, uh, and for your family, and being an immigrant to the United States. 
Yeah, so um, it's quite a story, so bear with me. Um, and I'll try to be brief. I, I think my perspective on intersectionality and my mm -hmm experience with healthcare is really has shaped my motivation for medicine, right? blah, blah, blah. but it also has shaped my conviction to be involved with healthcare reform. Um, I'm an immigrant. Um, I came here when I was a child with my parents and um, I, my exposure to healthcare was very much negative, right? Uh, we were covered uh, because my parents worked two jobs just to make sure that my, their kids were covered under um, their work coverage. Um, however, every time we would go to the doctors, it was mostly for my parents, not for us. And when we went to the doctors, I was a translator for my mom. So even though we had the access to health care, it was not the best care ever. Uh, I saw my mom continuously frustrated, um, avoiding the doctors all the time because um, she doesn't really understand the system. The system is not very simple. Um, you have to go to get your x-rays at one location, but then you go to primary care at one location, you go to your specialist somewhere else, and then you get this huge bill because none of them were covered. Um, and you didn't know any better. Um, and when you are a family of five um, with people who don't really know the language very well, money is tight. Um, you grow up in a very low uh, SES kind of environment. And you don't really think much about it. I was very uh, fortunate that my parents didn't really present that, and it's not something that you reflect on as a 12-year-old or 11-year-old. It's something you reflect on as a 20-something-year-old, right? You're like, holy crap, that happened. Like, that's actually an issue. Um, and then you begin to kind of address those things. Um, so a lot of the time, it was just avoiding the doctors, uh, not taking care of your hypertension, not taking care of your diabetes, not taking care of that rheumatoid arthritis that's kind of creeping in the back of the door. Um, immigrant issues arose. I ended up being about 18, staying here, or staying my visa because my parents had to go back. So our asylum was not, it was, um, it was not accepted. So I overstayed my visa and I was undocumented medical, or student, who was not really a student because I had a scholarship that was given to me and I could not use it. Um, it's a kind of, for someone who was raised in an environment of like education being a huge issue, it was very, very frustrating. I had no coverage whatsoever for healthcare. I was a four year track uh, sports mania person. I was in track, flag football, cheerleading, and I could not do anything that would harm me because I would like completely not be covered and my parents were not around so I would have to pay that bill myself. Um, it's a time where you don't think about anything. My eyesight was awful. Like I can see you guys because I have my glasses on but I was like 18 and I could not see anybody. And I didn't think that was an issue <laughs> until like, I got glasses at like 20 something. Um, it's like little things like that that kind of like make you think about what does access mean? What does everybody in mean? Um, down the line, years later, I meet my wonderful husband. We are together. Paperwork is great. I am a citizen. And we're still students making our way through, living off scholarships and loans. And he gets wrapped in my houses. I don't know if anyone knows that, what that is. But he gets wrapped up. He's in the hospital for four days, getting like a bunch of fluid. And I'm just like, you could be doing this at home just drink water, <laughs> like drink a lot of water. You can take care of us at home. Um, four days go by and we get a $30,000 bill that we have to pay. And it's kind of like, well, we're broke. So you, we got to work around with, I don't know who we spoke with, a bunch of different people for like a month. It was like a month process to like figure out how we're gonna pay for this. And we got it down to like payments of like $50 a month and we're still paying them off. Um, it's like 10 years down the line. Oh. Holy crap, 13 years down the line. And we're still paying that off, right? Because it's $50 a month, and thankfully it doesn't accrue interest. But I'm here as a citizen, and I still don't have access. So anyway, a couple years more down the line, he gets a wonderful job with great coverage. I have amazing coverage. My co-pays are maybe like $10. Um, I can get medications for less than that. Um, I can go see my doctor whenever I need it. I can get into specialists whenever I want. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, no, healthcare is something that you don't use unless you're dying. You know, we have to realize that the stories and the 
the identities that one has are not something that just goes away after you get access. Um, it's a baggage that you carry throughout and like thinking about how am I gonna raise my kids? Am I going to take them to the doctors when they have a cough? Or are they fine, right? Or, or what are my kids going to pick up from my issues with healthcare? What do you pick up from your parents' relationships with healthcare? Um, it's more than just what is present. It's my thoughts about everybody in. Thanks for sharing, Wendy. And that's one of the takeaways that I want to have from this panel is that through people's stories, we can understand that healthcare delivery is much more nuanced than some sweeping piece of reform. And so, uh, disclaimer, I'm all for single payer. I love single payer. I'd love to like get, you know, push some of this legislation through. But I also want us to critically think about how sweep, sweeping reform may leave some people behind. It may not address all of their needs, right? And I imagine that some of us here in the audience have stories with our own family or our patients that they might be willing to share. And if anybody wants to share any particular experience, you're welcome to. Or if you have questions of our panelists, um, I just want to open it uh, to ask questions at any time as well. Okay, did you want to get started with people telling their stories? Yeah, does anybody have a good story? The had her yeah. hand up. Yeah. Um, it's not really that long of a story, but just to um, reiterate the fact that like, once we pass the single payer system, hopefully soon, um, there's still gonna be work to do. Um, so my mom took my grandma to the doctor. She has um, diabetes and can't walk that well. And um, the doctor told her, my mom asked about um, getting um, handicap parking, because it would be easier for um, my grandmother, and the doctor told her no, because she would just abuse it. So like, those kinds of things, like, doctors still need to be, like, there still needs to be, like, a change within, like, healthcare workers themselves to make sure, like, health disparities um, uh, don't continue. So it won't just be legis legislation. The panel wants to like expand on that a little bit. I know we talked, uh, that's an example, but particularly people of color and black women, in particular, we were talking about the mortality rate of black women. What are the implications that that has just in general, not even just in the healthcare industry, but to our society? Um, so thanks for sharing your story. Um, so let me see, here in New York, um, when we have done organizing in the last couple of years, um, we've started to organize more explicitly um, to promote uh, single payer as a racial and immigrant justice issue. And um, uh, sometimes when I talked to crowds who are interested in doing anti-racist work or um, in particular organizing around um, black maternal mortality, um, that's been a, a big uh, source of discussion in the city recently, people say things like, um, oh, you know, access isn't everything or um, yeah, but there's so many other um, issues that contribute to racism and healthcare. Um, and I totally agree, you know, Racism in healthcare um, is such a complex issue. There's no single silver bullet that's gonna um, that's gonna solve it. Uh, you know, racism happens at the structural level, the interpersonal level between individuals, and then internally inside all of us in different ways. Um, and single payer is not gonna solve all of that. There's just so much to it. The education system largely won't be affected by the single payer legislation. Um, you know, like the, all of the um, individual level racism that we learn in our society won't be affected directly through it. But I think that, um, that single, I mean, this is an opportunity for us to use both and language. We can say that, 
you know, single payer makes a significant, will make a significant difference in how resources are distributed um, in communities of color, um, in immigrant communities. Um, it will really stop a lot of these powerful systems, hospital systems, insurance systems, um, pharmaceutical systems from enacting white supremacy and saying that certain bodies are and lives are worth more than others. Um, and so I, I think, you know, and we have to work on um, defeating racism in other ways. You know, there's so many different ways that anti-racist movements and activists are working to, to defeat it. I don't think they're, you know, they're not opposing um, forces. I think that, you know, it, it's a lot of work. Um, but I think we, we can work with people on these issues. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think also, so I, uh, I'm not quite sure too much about um, pushing back against some of um, the implicit bias that exists in the education system. Um, beyond realizing that we in our own generation, we can start to model the behavior that we and that we want to see in that system, in the healthcare system, just in society in general, um, while also realizing that there are a lot of things that we're trying to defeat. So um, like managing some kind of care while trying to advocate for a better world, like for yourself, is always a good, important, and valuable thing to remember. Um, I think in terms of the way that I approach advocacy um, being like in addition to single payer is really that, I mean, a lot of my research nowadays is on um, health disparities and community level disparities like on the neighborhood level that look at both health access as well as the other, um, like at housing and justice involvement um, as well, like in the larger question of like, I work on income inequality that's a huge issue. And so I think one way that we can start to build on the promise of single payer is that while we are learning to be advocates for single payer, also be advocates for other issues that, ta like that are directly connected to health as a whole picture. So um, there are a, um, there's a number of things. So I saw a couple of y'all at um, an immigrant health access day, uh, advocacy day in Albany um, just last week, showing up for other communities that may not be, may not understand single payer, but like they need our help showing up there as much as we can. There are, like there are issues around housing, voting, like voting reform, with like, um, justice involvement, free bail. Um, these are spaces where health advocacy lives and absolutely needs your voices, our voices. And so I think it's almost realizing that we do actually have to juggle a few different um, kinds of advocacy in the overall picture of health equity um, while we're fighting for single payer, while we're fighting for when we get it, the implementation to be fair um, to all of our communities. and afterwards in that new world, because that world still has a lot of issues that need us. So something that I've heard in the single payer community um, from individuals is that single payer is actually, you, you know, the, some of this legislation is extremely comprehensive, which it is, which we've seen from Pamela's bill and even Bernie's bill, that they cover a lot of services. and so they argue that we should focus solely on single payer to cover a lot of these vulnerable populations. Um, what would you say to somebody and how would you uh, get them to think through the lens of uh, the intersectionality perspective? Um, one of the things that I would say is that providing access does not fix the distrust that's already instilled in the system. Um, you can provide all the access you want. I know a large immigrant community who will not go to doctors because they're in fear of their immigrant status or because even if they are okay with their paperwork, they don't trust the system because they are, they're looked at with condensation, like they're, people are condescending just because you are an immigrant does not mean that you are not a professional. <laughs> you know, my parents were, political accountants for banks in, in, their, in our country. Um, coming here, yes, they worked in restaurants for a little while, um, 
but they're super smart people. Like, my dad's very intellectual, more than I, I would say. So to be spoken upon in a negative manner or like, oh, you're just dumb because you don't get what medical terminology is. Like, no, my uncle's a doctor. I think we're fine. Um, it's just the distrust that's in the system is present. And it'll carry over not just this generation, but the next and the one after. Um, so you have to be mindful that single payer is not going to fix medical, the medical system. It just won't. It's a great step, but there's so much more that needs to be done. And there's no reason why we can't be doing everything in parallel. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what Wendy said. Um, you know, I think in medicine we inherit a great system of patriarchy and um, sexism and racism. Our educations are built on um, on learning off of sick people who are disproportionately poor and people of color. Academic teaching hospitals are almost always in poor communities, and even if you're in a largely white city or state, you know I think often you'll find that the patients who come to teaching hospitals um, are more likely to be people of color, and. Um, so we directly benefit, um, our education benefits off of this sickness. It's a very perverse relationship. So I think some of the work that we have to do in general, uh, you know, in medicine, but in particular in this movement for single payer is start to make, um, you know, anti-racism, anti-oppression trainings part of our trainings or discussions, however you want to, you know, include that kind of um, dialogue into our, into our work and make it kind of just a standard part of our work, however you see fit. I think the only thing I'd add, because both of you all covered this really well, um, is that we also need to make partnership and coalition building um, a regular part of what we do. Um, just that relationship building, communicating with people who you don't know, know, but they have powerful ties to the kinds of things that will help break that system down. I work with a lot of community-based organizations. If you're looking at immigrant groups, um, like I immigrant communities, um, people who are justice involved, people in the harm reduction space, um, those are the first places that anyone um, goes to when they're trying to navigate healthcare access. And so, I mean, one thing, for example, that I see in a single payer system is really, um, is really making sure that there is funding and capacity building available for CBOs in the outreach um, and uh, like a portion because that is culturally responsive, linguistically appropriate um, services that are there. They've had the training for years. They know their community. That's how we can make sure that people actually trust this new system enough to sign up for it. It's only single payer is absolutely a first step in how we get make sure that we make it a continuing evolution of health equity is really by that relationship building across spaces. I think as one concrete example of that, um, here in New York State over the years, our, um, the statewide campaign for single payer um, had had a, um, I think, a, like a rocky relationship with the reproductive rights movement. Um, and through like long-term relationship building and coalition building with them, eventually um, uh, contraception and um, abortion services were explicitly named in, um, in the state single payer bill. Um, and so I think concrete, uh, you know, concrete uh, changes like that and demands um, can come out of that long-term relationship building. And there's other examples of that. Like Wynn said earlier, the disability rights movement. Um, here we just recently, in the last couple of months, um, our bill includes long-term care, which is the result of like long-term relationship building and arguing between um, the single payer movement and the disability rights movement. Um, so that's the kind of work we have to do in each of our communities. And so, you know, I, I, my question to you is like, are your SNAP groups, do you have relationships with the, you know, the, um, the groups in your school that represent students of color, the groups in the communities um, around your hospital, if there's advocacy groups or local community groups, um, and what opportunities do you have to talk with them, support them, build relationships? I know it's hard as a student, you have a lot going on, but, you know, these are sort of the, I think for me, long-term goals. devil's advocate question. While I totally am supportive of anti-discrimination and all that, I'm concerned that if, if the single-payer movement 
takes a predominantly uh, heavy stance in this direction that it could be a turnoff to the large majority of the opposition who is 48% of America. What do you think about that? Um, I don't think we, we will win um, without having um, anti-racists, people of color, and immigrants um, on our side. And if we do win that way, then that won't be the win that we want. Um, I think I'm very proud of the organizing that we're doing here in New York because um, even at this very advanced stage of our campaign, um, it is still very much a grassroots campaign and the people um, and organizations involved um, will be the same people and organizations that are involved in the implementation of, of single payer um, when it passes, which it will soon, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, and so let's say, let's say a largely white progressive movement one um, single payer in any given state, then you know the implementation of it wouldn't then um, make sure to to reach out to um, marginalized communities, communities of color, immigrant communities, and um, and doing the you know enacting and implementing the bill um, will be like more than half the battle uh, when we get to that stage. And having strong relationships in those communities is what's going to make it. Successful, you know, um, because no, you know, there's no doubt that when this passes, there will be immediate um, the other side, the moneyed interests, will start organizing against us, and you know, and they will try to defeat the passage of the bill at every moment. Um, and so, I think that without broad and deep um, relationships, especially in those marginalized communities, we um, like we won't be able to maintain that win. So, I have a question one. up here at the top. Runa, thank you so much for talking about the need for medical students to connect with community organizations and patient organizations. Um, that's something that we've been trying to do on a campaign uh, to save the psych unit at the Allen Hospital, which is just like 30 blocks that way. Um, and one thing that we've kind of run into is a lot of the ways that medical students have been interacting with the community and community groups in the past has been as service providers, as information providers, and the information has really just flowed in that one direction. Kind of bringing up what Wendy said about that like condescension and distrust and sort of letting that remain. And so I'm wondering if you have advice for how to let the information flow in both directions and to like really build durable, trusting relationships where the power and the uh, information sharing is more equitable. Great question. <laughs> um, great question, thank you. I mean, it's challenging, there's no like, uh, there's no like neat answer to that, um, and I think a lot of it is in trial and error. Um, but I, you know, some advice I have maybe from my experiences doing community organizing in the past are um, to find the organizations in the community that are already doing the organizing, and um, and and I bet in Washington Heights there's strong community groups that have a history of progressive organizing in the community because this is not the first challenge I'm sure they've faced, you know. Um, especially with town gown relationships, there, you know the the hospital academic complex is always um, uh, there's always a tense relationship with the community. So I guess I would my suggestion would be to find the you know those progressive groups and people and elements and just um, you know listen you know and and see if you can develop relationships with them. And you know while you I mean you do have an urgent task ahead like very um, like ahead of you, um, and I think sometimes like we step into, we learn about new issues, and there is a sense of urgency. But um, probably for the community, like this is one of many things that they've faced. And um, while you probably and your group probably wants to like work on it right away, um, you know the the community may have a different approach. Um, so I think just like listening for a while um, might be useful. Um, I recently uh, got to know the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, which is uh, like a progressive community-based, um, like high-touch organizing or, uh, organization in the Northwest Bronx. 
and they've been around for 45 years. Um, and you know, I'm sure they have so much like fascinating history to learn from. Um, I, they have recently like embraced single payer as an issue, um, and it's just been really inspiring to like witness how they function and like learn, like just learn from them. And um, so. I think you know if you are lucky enough to be invited to like a community meeting, maybe just you know bring a small number of people and like listen and see how people talk and operate and function, and then start like building relationships there. If they have events that um, you know that they invite you to, then I would just go and start to um, you know build relationships. And also, as medical students or physicians, we can offer like those services. Um, in some fashion, so you know, you might ask, like, uh, is there something that would be useful for you to know in terms of, like, can we help with like medical knowledge somehow? Are are there needs that people have? And I think, you know, sometimes like substantively people have needs, um, but then also, I think um, doing sort of um, more, I don't mm, like what's the word, like making a show of your um, like support. I think makes. Uh, big difference in relationship building. And so, for example, I mean, you know, doing blood pressure screenings or really simple um, medical interventions. Um, or like, for example, recently in East New York, there's a, we talked to a community group. They were doing a mammogram van. They'd already organized it. And they invited us to come and like um, to speak, uh, to pass out single payer literature. So, um, which was really kind of them. And a lot of times like service provision is very divorced from um, demanding like, large-scale social change, so that was a great opportunity for us. So I don't know, those are just some ideas. <laughs> um, just something really quick on that topic. I think you should really focus, as a SNAP organization, to um, focus on quality over quantity. Mm -hmm. um, when you are trying to go into a community and um, reach out to them, you don't just go once and then move on to the next community and then move on and just hit them all, right, before single period goes through. Um, you need to build rapport and you need to be present um, monthly or quarterly. I don't know how you wanna establish it, but know the limits of your organization because if you don't have the manpower to address four or five different communities, you're gonna do a very mediocre job at building that trust. And it could backfire and actually result in someone who's like, oh, you know what, they're not really serious. Single parent doesn't care about us. They just wanted to like put the two cents and move on. Um, they don't care about our issues or our concerns. So make sure it's tricky because you want to outreach so much, but you cannot compensate like the quality of that rapport for how many people you can target. Yeah, and along those lines, I think like avoiding tokenizing mm -hmm. people is very important. So tokenizing um, people from minority groups, um, people from the community. So I think you know it's like slow to build meaningful real solidarity-based relationships. I'm curious to know um, here what you've seen in terms of productive collaborations with other healthcare workers, um, primarily uh, workers of color, immigrant workers. I'm thinking specifically of home health workers. Um, uh, I would recommend a partner for your student group could be the SEIU 1199 um, PCAs. I met with them last Thursday um, on an unrelated project, but um, was really um, moved to hear about the challenges that they experience in their daily lives and in carrying out the functions of their work. And I, I think they would be um, powerful partners for this movement. Yeah, um, that's a great point. I mean, 1199 has been supportive of uh, the single payer movement um, here in New York State. And actually, so um, my organization is on the steering committee of a um, statewide movement called the Caring Majority, which is um, essentially a movement of home care workers, um, people living with disabilities and long-term care needs, um, families, and co like people who have been affected by the workforce development perspective. And I think that um, making connections with um, 
with but like with home care workers is a great uh, is a great example of how we can kind of build power across what health equity means in the single payer space. Um, so whether that is um, I, so the, like I'm speaking from our New York State per, uh, perspective, but in other states or on the national level, um, some of what Runa says like kind of rings true of like going to their uh, to their events, having conversations with them, involving them in the policy space. Um, and I think that that is a powerful ally as well as a power like a community that really needs to be seen across single payer spaces. So I'm not quite sure of other groups to recommend in other states, but. Um, I think that's a great example. Yeah, the um, I mean, the inclusion of long-term care um, in the um, you know in general in single-payer organizing is um, brings up exactly what you said. It it really um, certainly it affects like the patients who are um, receiving the long-term care, um, but it also fundamentally will affect the the workers who often have the hardest jobs in medicine and are paid by far the lowest, you know, sometimes $8 an hour to, um, to do the work we see in hospitals of daily, um, you know, care of people who are sick um, in like the most intimate ways. Um, and so 1199 has done a lot. 1199 is the, um, is like the largest healthcare workers union in the city. And it's a subset of um, SEIU nationally, which is one of the largest uh, service workers unions um, in the country. And they in New York have done a lot of organizing of home care health, uh, like home health aides, home care workers, um, and you know, who are mostly um, low income women, often women of color, often immigrants. Um, and so in um, including long term care, I think that there's like, uh, you know, really huge opportunity to improve the lives of those workers. Um, and so we have made um, relationships at uh, like an organizational level with um, like what Wynn said, the Caring Majority, which is a coalition group, um, the National Domestic Workers Alliance, which um, is a group that's kind of, I think that's self-explanatory. Um, and, um, and 1199, I, I think there's opportunities for those relationships to be deeper and more meaningful. Because um, I think sometimes, you know, some organizations may not be willing to you know, be as strong advocates as possible. And then what you bring up, meeting with individual workers, I think that often unions in general um, don't engage their rank and file workers as much as they could. Um, and I think as, as students, as healthcare workers, um, working in hospital systems, we have an opportunity to have those conversations um, that, I don't know, could be part of our organizing. So it's, uh, it's interesting to hear that you're doing that. <clears throat> One thing I'm thinking about as well, um, in addition to home care workers, is that a lot of families provide that care unpaid. That's a, that makes ho like long-term care is a workforce development issue, especially for um, women, uh, women of color, immigrant families. Um, this is a missed opportunity at income and at um, career development. And so I think um, in terms of, I know that uh, doctors uh, don't have a lot of time with their uh, with their patients, but understanding and engaging with the story of healthcare from like but like from also looking at like if you have patients who have long term care needs, um, also talking with their families and engaging with those stories, um, they might not be able to take the time to advocate, but those are stories that you can bring as physicians to the organizing. Um, perspective when you are lobbying, when you are talking with your other, with, with your colleagues, bringing those stories and that, like can help bring alive why single payer and why health equity in like in health policy is so important. So I've had very progressive classmates of mine say, I'm really sympathetic to single payer, but we know that social determinants of health are what's driving a lot of these health disparities. And I'd rather us use our political capital addressing social determinants rather than focus on single payer. So I think the, you know, the first response is obviously let's do both, but it has got me thinking, and the question I pose to you is, are there ways that we can message around single payer that more explicitly brings in social determinants of health and or are there ways that we could redesign or tinker with the single payer policy to make it more receptive to improving social determinants? Good question. Um, I think, I mean, for a first step, um, single payer making that accessible allows 
families and communities to have more resources that they can put towards the needs that they have, like housing, um, like uh, food, but like help, being in neighborhoods that provide them um, access to quality food, access to transportation that's nearby to them, safe and clean urban environments. Um, that's a first step in the conversation, but then we also do have to actually make sure that they that um, communities are able to access, like to use those resources towards other needs, which is why I kind of think about um, going back to what you're saying about both and, like we do need to be actively advocating for a policy that addresses the social determinants, like marrying health access with the other things, so like showing up for rent reform um, and for like the advocacy days and like showing up in those different spaces because those are actually um, like coalition building requires building across areas and like uh, areas of like issue areas that really determine someone's ability to live a whole and happy life. Um, so I think it's a hard question, but I think the, the answer to me is working on things as much as you can in multiple areas. Yeah, I agree with what, what Wynn said, but I think that people sometimes underestimate like um, how dramatic the potential redistribution of resources could be under a single payer system. Like we, we have a, a very segregated two-tier system um, of healthcare in this country, and we think it's normal. Um, I think when you are first entering as a student, and you um, you may be more sensitive to noticing the differences that you see, um, whether it's rich or poor patients, insured or non-insured patients, you know, black or white patients. Um, but uh, I think that you know, like in. New York, for example, um, over the last like 20 years, something like 15 hospitals have been closed in Brooklyn, you know, in the outer boroughs where the people are poorer and more likely to be people of color. And they're not closing in Manhattan. There's a couple that are closing in Manhattan, but for the most part, they're closing in these like poor communities. And, you know, it's complex, the reasons why, but a lot of it is driven by like our private insurance system um, and like the profit in healthcare. Um, and you know, if the system was different, and um, if resources were provided to communities by public health needs, then you know, so much would be different in those communities. Social determinants would change, not just directly in healthcare, but in jobs afforded to people, um, like Wynn said, in the the supportive services. Um, you know, supporting like transportation, for example, supporting um, the communities around those hospitals. So. Um, yeah, I think that's that may be one way to think about it. Yeah, there's a there's a great stat from Cal and Ward Community Health Center, which did the which crunched the numbers on how much single payer would save them um, under like the New York Health Act um, system, and they saw that it would they see about seventeen thousand primarily LGBTQ patients a year. Um, they would save over three million dollars annually. Um, that just like kind of to put a number to it, those are resources um, that, that's, that's a huge number that they can put back into their community in terms of the services. And a lot of these community health centers don't just do um, straight primary care or any of, like they do broad, uh, like, uh, like they do multiple different kinds of healthcare so, uh, services as well as nutrition education, um, really looking into the community, what they need, um, exercise. Like, uh, and so those are, um, those are resources that they could put back into um, their community and into their workforce. Um, yeah, and I think also like, especially because you're talking to your classmates, right? So I think it's important to let, the, like, to kind of show how social determinants of health in general, it's a bunch of different things under one theme. And one of the social, like one of the things is access. So it's not that you're, doing social determinants of health and then single payer for access. Like, mm. that is part of social determinants of health. When they're saying like, oh, well, we wanna address the social determinants of health, like, I'm like yeah, we are. Yeah. <laughs> like, access to healthcare is one of them. And single payer is a way to provide that. So it's not like it's either or, if that makes sense. So. I think also something that as students we can actively do, and it's something that I did uh, in my previous program. So I'm not a medical student, but I got a master's degree at a medical school that shared a lot of core curriculum. And we noticed in certain classes, um, like 
physiology, for example, when case studies were presented, it was a white man, it was a white woman, it was a white child. Um, we noticed in microbiology and dermatology courses when slides of like skin afflictions were shown, they were all shown on white skin. So realistically, you ask the question, how am I going to know what this looks like on someone who's not white? How am I going to know how to deal with this situation in terms of a patient who may not come from a wealthy, white, well-connected background? And something that I did at that school was I went to the teachers and I asked them questions like, why is it that every couple that is presenting in a clinic in your case studies happens to be heterosexual? Why is it that all of the names of the patients that you provide are Sarah, Jessica, Thomas, and Jerry? Like, why do they have to be all white? Um, and so lots of, lots of teachers were responsive to that. Lots of teachers said, Oh, good point, I didn't think of that. But, and of course, like a lot of the older white men teaching like didn't see the issue, but many, many teachers will respond to that. And I think it's, they're using these templates that are used over and over again and no one's like actually updating them. But when students bring things like that to their attention, so this is a form of advocacy that we can do at the student level is just say, we want our courses to be more inclusive, we want the case studies to be more representative. Yeah, I, that is that is like such a great statement you made. Um, I think that's one of the things that I really want students, like everyone, to take away is that um, be like keep your eyes open for opportunities to be advocates. Um, at all times, like as students, you can't just do, you can do that in the curriculum and be firm with curriculum, like. You know, we had that issue with dermatology. So for the second year, uh, they changed the curriculum and made it an inclusive dermatology week where we had one hour to address how these issues present in people of color. Um, like, no, like it should be the whole week. Like <laughs> you made a whole curriculum for an hour. Why don't I just like immerse it? So just keep advocating and keep being aware when it comes up, say something. Um, advocate for your patients when you're on rotations or if you have an inclusive curriculum in first and second year. Advocate for your patient who is not treated correctly or who uh, the doctor's kind of in and out really quickly. You're like, you know what? Uh, you just gave him a prescription that he's not gonna fill. Like what else can, what other management plan can we address that is, that takes into account their access and their social determinants of health and whether they're gonna be able to implement. Like, you can't give a $50 prescription to a patient who cannot afford it and think that that's gonna cure them because they're not gonna take it, they're not gonna buy it, and they're gonna have the issue still a month after. So you have to bring those tough conversations with that attending who might be a white male in the middle of Missoula, Montana. And you have to tell them like, hey, is there anything else we can provide? Uh, what other resources can we give them? Um, and, and you might be surprised. I'm in Billings, Montana, and I have like, the most progressive psychiatrist with me. We're talking healthcare policy. He was so excited I was coming here. He's like, take the weekend off. And I'm like, awesome. You know, and this is like Billings, Montana, which I was like so skeptical because I've heard so many horrible things about going on to Whammyland for a regional curriculum. So just voice it. You know, kind of be meeker about it in the beginning if you want to like test the waters out, but voice it because your patients depend on it. So it, it's just keep your eyes open. Yeah. Rena, did you have something to say before? Oh, I thought you were going to say something before. Um, no, I was just remembering like my experiences like taking care of patients. I think that, you know, I think, yeah, just to agree with what Wendy said, um, students are often in a position to um, uh, be skeptical of this very broken system that we have um, and both because you're seeing it with fresh eyes um, but also because you haven't been like ground down into it yet you know as yeah. as an attending like um, attendings just experience a lot of pressure that's driven by the you know profit model in healthcare, you know, and the, the pressure is to be very algorithmic, um, you know, very sort of factory oriented, see high volume patients, um, 
as many as you can and not be sensitive to like the you know unique needs of certain patient situations so you guys do i know it, you're also in like a difficult position because you are being evaluated so it's you know it's tricky um, but i think one of the things i am grateful for having gone through medical education is that i have learned to um, become a better advocate in general because i've learned how to you know um, put forward uh, challenging ideas in uh, in a way that you know I think is uh, you know I try to be polite. Politeness is not always warranted, but um, but uh, you know in a in a way that I try to be as articulate as possible. And I think that that, that is some of the um, the opportunity that you have in training in like such a screwed up system as we have. Yeah, and and just a rotation tip, if you are able to present the problem and a solution, do the homework for them, they're busy people, right? Like that will go a long way because you're not just giving them like, hey, how are they actually going to pay for this prescription? Do you really think that's gonna work? You're actually telling them like, hey, um, we can't give them this prescription, but maybe we could actually have them follow up in the clinic in a week and I can contact the care management there and they can actually connect them with vouchers for that prescription. And um, have you heard about the single payer bill? Yeah. <laughs> maybe you could call your senator as a attending physician and tell them to support it. Yeah, you so like just... Too. Depends on your relationship. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. Um, so I just wanted to say, because I know we're gonna wrap You're up soon. Can y'all hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Um, so I think like when we're talking about intersectionality, this is just a sociologist in me coming out. And her work, just to anchor this conversation, and it's because I think you brought it up about curriculum, right? Uh, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw is really a legal scholar. Mm -hmm. People confuse it all the time and think that she's just a sociologist, but really she's a legal scholar. And that sets a, a great precedence for how you guys can think about intersectionality because when you think of the legal system, you have to think of the infrastructural ways that racism and sexism mm. is taking place. That's why intersectionality is so important. And while it is great that we do coalition and grassroots organizing work, I challenge everybody in here who has privilege, namely my cisgen uh, cisgendered heterosexual white men in the room, that you have to be an ally in the verb form and you have to challenge the system by saying we need to change the curriculum, right? Like we need to include, we, you need to require of your medical schools that they have more black female physicians being professors at your school. You have to require of them a, an accountability for the LGBTQ community and indigenous people who the erasure is real for, mm -hmm. right? That was the point of intersectionality, is to say that as a black woman, in organizing spaces or in the world, in the diaspora period, my sexism is racialized and my racism is sexualized. That's exactly what it means. And so, I, I mean, that's encouraging to hear that you, you push back on the narrative um, a bit. And I know, like, we're, we're going to wrap up, but I did want to anchor the conversation around that, that the fight is not just grassroots organizing, which is an extremely powerful tool, but the real power building happens in the rooms where when you're sitting around the table and it's just y'all. If you sit around the table and it's just y'all at the table, and there are no women, there are no people of color, there are no other abled people at the table, that's the most power, and that's how you start to deconstruct the infrastructural forms of racism and sexism, so. Thanks, Kina. Um, so one final question that I wanna wrap up with, and this is for each of the panelists, but in dealing head on with a lot of these uh, corporate interests in implementing or advocating for single payer, as well as taking into consideration all of these different variables that may play into a patient's healthcare, you know, burnout is a very real concern in the medical community and even in the advocacy community as well. And so I want to go through each um, and ask each one of you kind of what drives you in this, in this work, in this movement, but also, like, what are some like actual tangible tips that you can give to us as advocates and medical students and physicians to prevent that burnout? And yeah, um, I guess I'll start because I have like the least experience or exposure, right, so far. Um, I think what 
drives me is my story, and then seeing my story in my patients. Uh, when I see my patients, I see resemblance, I see similarities, I see the struggles that they face that I may be kind of familiar or even not experienced by myself, but I heard so-and-so say something like this and I'm aware of it. I think that really drives me, just knowing that I can make a small but significant change in their daily life. Um, so that's what keeps me motivated through all of this and through actually getting through step studying and all the horrid stuff that medical school has. Um, in terms of advocacy, right? <laughs> in terms of advocacy, I would say know your limits. Um, I think sometimes you see someone who is willing to risk thus much and you're like almost pressure, you self pressure yourself into thinking I have to do the same. And it's not, everyone's advocacy is their own path and your own journey. So you have to kind of see like, what can you risk? What can you do? What will make you feel okay with your work? Um, and it's not gonna be the same thing for everybody. Um, I'm not the person who's gonna go uh, and be part of a huge civil, dis we spoke about this, like a, a huge civil civilians, um, Exposure because I, I my struggle has taught me that I did not work this hard to get arrested I'm like very anti that right or like that scares me that doesn't make me feel comfortable So I can't do that, but I can't do a lot of outreach and I love doing rallies, right? You have to kind of and if you went to the other session, you know what I'm talking about um, You have to know what advocacy fits you and explore it and then do it all the time so yeah I guess I was, I'm just thinking about what motivates me. I mean, probably in the like, um, in the like day to day, um, I think what motivates me to do this work is that um, there's just like a really great community of single payer advocates. Um, and I feel like I have genuine, I've made very genuine friendships with them. And, um, uh, and uh, it's related to the burnout question. Um, I, I like I agree with Wendy that like knowing your limits like when you're tired it's okay to you know take a break or uh, not not do whatever activist deadline you have um, but I think that it's uh, the work is helped by creating like a warm friendly community and so if you can make your organizing um, like social and fun and um, and supportive uh, I think it it just makes it better um, rather than like another thing to do because we all have too many things to do you know um, so for example we Wayne and I went to Rochester a few weeks ago to there was an upstate um, organizing conference for the state campaign um, and the people who organized up there it was a day-long um, event and the people who organized up there they brought like six crock pots of chili, all different yeah. kinds, like meat and not meat. And I was like so touched by that, 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 that this movement is still made up of people who are like bringing their crock pots of chili to the, um, to the conference. <laughs> and, um, and they fed us all, it was very impressive. And it actually kind of inspired me to be like, maybe, and I think I learned from them that they do, um, the group in Rochester does like a monthly uh, potluck meeting dinner. And I was like, you know, we should do that. So. Um, I'm thinking about having like our people of color, color and immigrants group do that um, monthly. New York, it's a little hard to like bring a crock pot on the subway for an hour and a half. <laughs> so we might just like meet in Chinatown, get some dim sum or something. But um, so I think, you know, I think you should be in touch with your, yeah, like what makes you happy and warm and not tired. Um, and then I think in terms of what motivates me to do this work, um, you know, it's complex. Like I, certainly in terms of my professional experience, I trained in the Bronx, um, in the North Bronx, and, and I trained with, um, you know, in a community that's like all people of color immigrants and poor and working people. Um, and then, you know, I, I've worked in Manhattan since then um, in very different communities. Um, and it's just like enraging to see how, you know, healthcare is just, so different in different places um, and for different people. So I think that motivates me professionally. Um, I think personally, um, I am just aware of how, you know, my parents are immigrants. They came from India, they grew up with like, you know, extreme third world poverty and they, 
Um, you know, and I uh, have had access to a great education and a pretty good life here. And, um, you know, and they and many people like them believe that the reason that they are doing okay compared to how they grew up is because of meritocracy and because they, um, you know, the, they have special traits and skills and powers and they survived. And of course, you know, my parents um, are very like smart, strong people and they've done a lot of good for themselves. But as someone growing up here, like I it just, it seems so clear to me that um, that, you know, they were selected by the state, you know, by policies that we have. And while some of their individual efforts did, um, you know, yield the outcomes that of their lives and in my own life, um, the, the kind of systems that we have and um, how much access to public goods that we have fundamentally just like changes people's lives and opportunities. You know, the kind of education that I had access to um, was because of a great progressive movement for public education in this country 100, 150 years ago. And you know, you can apply that kind of historical analysis to so many things. So, um, you know, for me, systemic um, and structural change is just like the most incredible thing. And I think, um, yeah, I feel like I owe it to someone to do that work. <laughs> When Runa was talking about Rochester, I totally thought that she was going to bring up this vegetarian cannibal movie that we watched and <laughs> different kind of, kind of like community building. But it was a feminist movie. It was really crazy. It was, it was a lot. <laughs> uh, I think what moves me, what motivates me, um, the work is good. The work is so good to do this. Um, this is you're fighting to make things better for everyone, just at the heart of that. That is a great goal, and I love that so much. Um, and I mean, it's the, like, and being able to do that with other communities, with really positive communities, the single payer advocacy space, that's kind of what actually really brought me to being a single payer advocate, was that there was a really beautiful and positive, inclusive, coalition that was built in my experience in New York and that was something that I work in a lot of advocacy spaces. It is very easy to get run down and pessimistic and very dark humor about um, the advocacy and that is not, it's not what I get in the single payer space and so I think if you can build spaces like that, that's a great part of being able to continue to be an advocate, recognizing that you're tired. When you're tired, I'm to be honest a little exhausted today and it's been, and it's been um, a few months of being really, really on top of things in my work. And so I think really knowing your limits and being honest with others in your space, if you can, if you have a couple people you trust um, about just how, if you're feeling run down, reaching out, basic things, therapy, friend building, um, kind of having that time for you um, especially if your friends who are advocates are also people you can go to like that. I had a breakdown one day um, in early December, right be before something known as uh, the public charge rule was being, um, was like in the final days of that common period. It's essentially something that was going to uh, limit immigrant access to basic needs, food, housing, healthcare. Um, I was so tired and so stressed out. I texted one of um, essentially my mentor in the health advocacy space and I was just crying. And she was telling me that that morning um, she had had a meltdown because the coffee machine wasn't working and that's where she was at of just being, <laughs> just being that tired that like just that one thing let you off. And that helped me to be able to be honest with other people in the space about how the work is good but the work is hard. And so, um, and we're both, we're both Asian American women of color and queer and um, adding in kind of some of those levels of just how tiring um, breaking down impression when you're kind of part of that intersectional identity can be. Um, and then finding ways to build yourself up so that you can continue doing the work is really important. This weekend's kind of the first time in a while that I've just shut, shut off my laptop. <laughs> and I'm feeling a little bit better for it. So I think really kind of making sure that you're 
that you that you know you love, like the work is good, but just check in with yourself and remember the human part of it and what you need before you can't help, <laughs> like what is it, the airplane thing? You can't help your butt, <laughs> like help yourself before you help other people. <laughs> um, I don't know if that was useful, but <laughs> it's just, just like, making sure to check in with yourself as well as just those honest human needs that you have. So I just wanted to say thank you to the panelists. Thank you for your knowledge and your experience, but also thank you for yours as well as the audience's stories in helping elucidate some of these topics. Um, so please just join me in uh, another round of applause and thanking everyone. <laughs>